I, I want to really thank everyone for taking time, taking time out of your day and, and choosing to, to be here, to have one of the most precious things that we can give, which is presence and our attention. And I want to, I want to kind of make this, this ecoversity to find like what, what are, to talk a little bit and, and to share some consider, considerations that I've been having, that I've been working with and questions that I've been carrying of, about what might be needed for a new culture, a new regenerative culture to, to emerge and to be co-created. Like a lot of the work that I do is going to be uh, based on the, the body of work called possibility management. Possibility management is an open code, copy left, that means it can never be copyrighted. I know some rebels out there are, love this and I love it too. Um, and it's, a, it's um, a body of work based on radical, on the principle of radical responsibility. I'm, I'm using responsibility here as um, consciousness in, in action. So what we are conscious about, what we are aware about, we have a choice about. And so it's a, it's a body of work based in, in practices and it's a, it's a research field and it's been developing in the last um, 30 years and it's come out of Europe. And in the, the, the kind of development that I've been doing in the conversations that I've been having with um, many different uh, people from different traditions, it's, it kind of seems to be like a, like a deeply transformative um, body of initiations, initiations into uh, authentic adulthood. And so this is, for me, it's important to set because uh, I want to define adulthood not as, okay, you're over 18 or 21 and bam, you're an adult. Adulthood, see, it's like a, a higher level of responsibility. So currently, I find that modern culture, the culture, the mainstream culture that we see globally is at the child level of responsibility. So when... Um, when a child makes a mess, who cleans it up? It's usually the parents or the mother uh, in most patriarchal um, cultures. And so this is what's happening in the world. Humanity, different, the modern culture is making a lot of messes, different messes, toxic ways um, of in, uh, over consumption of um, an over exploitation of nature, um, nuclear um, waste, pollution, uh, deforestation, all of these messes, and who's cleaning them up? So who's cleaning them up is usually the next generations or someone else. So this is what I mean with having a um, child level of responsibility. And everyone here, you are taking already by being here and by being part of this group, you're already taking more responsibility than the majority of people in the world. So you're like edge workers. You work on the edge of what modern culture offers and you create new cultures. And these initiations into adult adulthood and authentic adulthood uh, should have occurred. And like we had used to have these in traditional cultures that bef before um, a child would um, become an adult in a village, it will go through a series of processes and go from consuming from the village into being part, knowing their part in the village, um, collaborating. And I think we, we lost that basically in modern culture. And so I love possibility management because it has, it's, it brings back like real authentic processes of initiation without co-opting or appropriating indigenous um, practices from other countries and other lands. I'm going to breathe because I feel tingling of fear of what 
what will come out of my mouth basically during this meeting. And this is great because that means the, the room is alive. So most of you are in education or have something to do with education or have wounds about education. Who here has wounding about education? I, I know I do. Yeah. Exactly. And this is because um, in many ways, you know, like the, the, the mainstream way of educating is separating a child from life, trying to teach them about life and removing a lot of the resources that humans have, separating them and um, deciding that they're not at all um, relevant to, to the industrial world. Which is, which is right, you know, the, uh, the industrial world does not really care so much, or the, the capitalist world does not really care um, about life purpose unless it feeds the economy. So one of the, one of the things that possibility management and other practices and other ways of, of learning start reclaiming our humanity, start reclaiming our own innate resources that no culture, no um, education system can really remove. It can kind of make us forget or numb, but it can't really take that uh, from us. And this is our emotions and our feelings. So this is what's gonna be mostly about this, this kind of talk. And my, my proposal is that I talk a little bit and then have some questions and um, in, in like groups of two or three, and then we come back to harvest. And I'd, I'd really like to do a, like at least one, maybe two practices so that it's not just a mental thing, but you can really experience. So I can't, I don't know how to, to, to find consensus or consent when I can't see all of your faces, but if you have any paramount objection to this, uh, please either say something right now or write it in the chat. I don't have any objection, but I'll have to turn my camera off. I hope it's for all of you. I'll be using my microphone, but without the camera, I hope. Um, Thank you. I wonder if there's any objection, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. you. You don't have to use your camera for, for the whole time. I would love to see your faces and that's only my personal preference. So you take care of yourselves and your internet connection and what makes, it, what makes you more present in this, in this ecoversity. And um, if you need to leave or if you need to leave early, that's totally fine. Um, just, yeah, just send a message on the chat just to say goodbye. And don't worry if you can't come on video, it's all right. Okay. I find it really useful the, to have distinctions. Distinctions is kind of a, um, a discernment consideration that about reality that bef before we couldn't see we, we saw ma ma many things as one, and then after it's distinguished, we cannot ever see them again um, as one. So they're separate. But that doesn't mean they don't um, connect or interact with each other, so it's not like separation. It's just finding the, the different uses for each thing. So for example, I distinguish, and possibly manage, we distinguish that they're all of, from all of the emotional spectrum there's four basic feelings from which everything else is coming from like just imagine four main spices that you can just put a little pinch of this and like a huge chunk of that and you'll get um infinite basically close to infinite um um combinations and this is the whole of your emotional spectrum the four feelings are anger, sadness, fear, and joy. So ang anger, sadness, fear, and joy. Now, modern culture, when, I, when 
when I say this, most people in modern culture that they're really rooted, it's like, what gives? There's three bad feelings and one good feeling, like joy is the good one and anger, sadness, and fear being the bad one. So this is, this is a meme for modern culture that basically makes it not okay to, to feel. You know, if you think about it, most people in this planet, um, especially people who live in kind of um, a modern culture kind of context, mainstream culture, European colonial cu culture, they associate anger with uh, violence or with um, oppression, um, with power over. And they associate sadness, for example, with um, being unproductive or um, putting everybody down or trying to seek attention or weak. Especially in a patriarchal culture, if you're a man and you cry, you know, the, the classic thing is that you're considered weak. Um, and fear, fear as we see um, with the quarantine times, fear is very much seen as a bad emotion, a bad feeling, uh, because it makes us freeze. Uh, it's also unproductive. Uh, we can be easily controlled. And so when the thing is that the, when we considered, when we consider feelings good or bad, then we are going to have sometimes a conscious, sometimes an unconscious way of uh, suppressing part of our feeling experience and only wanting to direct our attention to having one type of experience. So if modern culture says it's not okay to feel anger, sad, uh, anger sadness, and fear, then we want to suppress, most people suppress them, and then only want things that have uh, but bursts of joy. But actually, joy is also not okay to feel in modern culture. It's okay to feel a little bit, but most people try to be absolutely ecstatic for three days on your work. Just come to work, meet your boss, whoever has a boss and works in, a, in, a, <laughs> in an office. Just meet your boss, be extremely ecstatic. And most people are, are seen when they're like that, they're seen as, as not serious or not really um, feeling the pain of the world or, or also not being productive or, you know, they must be on drugs or uh, they must be crazy. They must be like that crazy man that says hello to everybody in the street. For you to do that, you have to be crazy. You can't be that happy. So that's actually pretty sad. I find that pretty sad because what modern culture um, invisibly tells us is that it's not okay to feel at all. I don't know about you, but I had an upbringing, kind of a normal upbringing in, in, in the sense that my parents um, did not do kind of personal, like a lot of personal development or, um, and, and so they basically did their best to, to raise me. But one of the things that they used to say that I see parents time and time again do is to say to their kids, oh, it's okay. There's nothing to be scared of. Like I see, I saw um, this last summer, a, a child really small. So probably the first times that it was stepping into the water, stepping into water at the beach, you know, the cold ocean, because this is in, in Portugal. So the oceans, the Atlantic ocean, so cold water, seeing this big body of water for the first time and the child was was scared you know there's these things crazy things called waves coming at them and the mother was holding her hands the baby's hands and she was saying hey there's nothing to be scared of and kind of pushing her slowly towards the water when what i saw made me cry because what i saw was the mother unconsciously totally devalidating the child's experience, where the child was using their fear to assess if they were safe on how, like what was this new feeling touching the water and if they wanted to go further. And I saw the, the mother basically dismissing this. 
and say, no, it's okay, you go. There's nothing to be scared of. You know, I heard, who has, who has heard um, sentences like this? Who has heard, stop being angry? Keep your hand up if you, if you heard something like, why are you crying? There's other people that are suffering more. There's, you know, why are you so sad? You're so pretty. You know, why would you be sad? You know, as if feeling is something that's, that's wrong. There's something wrong with you if you feel something. So our society, modern culture, I actually don't consider myself part of modern culture so much. So I, but I'm going to say our society here. Our society is, is feeling phobic. And there's a reason for that, because those feelings hold wisdom and they hold power. And it's something that cannot be taken away unless we numb ourselves, unless someone numbs us, removes our capacity to feel. But as some of you might know someone who is, I'm sorry, I'm just going to mute everybody. As someone who, some of you might know someone who was um, a, substance, a substance abuser. Maybe you know someone, maybe you know someone that knows someone who is a substance abuser, either alcohol or drugs or sex or something else. Yeah, I know someone. And what happens when they're trying, when they're on the process of going again to back to health and going cold turkey and releasing um, and healing from their um, coping mechanism. They say the hardest part isn't to stop um, using. The hardest part is dealing with the emotions that come after. Because what was happening is those substances were hiding the unprocessed emotions about it. So this is, this is what we're encouraged to do since we're kids. First by our parents who don't know, but by society, by education, by school, by society at large. Entertainment, sex, uh, distraction, anything that will keep you from feeling. Just notice right now, if you are doing something, like what are your go-to um, strategies for not feeling? You have a, a hard conversation to have with a friend or you're um, wanting to, to ask something that might not be given to you. You are uh, wanting to put, you want, you're wanting to do something that you've never done before. What are your, the go-to strategies? Do you, do you go and smoke a cigarette? Do you distract by social media or um, by eating, socializing? I, this is not, this is not like the, the purpose of this is not guilt tripping anyone. I do that. We all do that because we haven't really, nobody has gone to school, I think from here. If you do, please tell me afterwards. But most people haven't gone to school and allowed themselves to have literacy about feeling. So, of course we feel. That is the thing, is that it doesn't matter if it's the feeling is good or bad, or if we try to repress or repress it. The feelings are still there. They start popping up sideways in conversations with um, our most close people, our, our loved ones, they, they bubble up in ways that we can't control. And so it's so important for if we want to, well, I think it's my opinion actually, that it's, it's so important in this new world that we're all building to feel. Feeling is not talking about feelings. So it's also not making 
um, studies about feelings. It's, it's about, it's really about feeling, experiencing the feeling itself and learning how to first, how to feel consciously because of my work um, in the last four years with, uh, with emotional literacy and competence development, most people that I came across, they've cut their ability to feel at a very young age, some before they could even speak. Most girls that I know, most women that I know, they cut their ability to be angry before they could speak because it wasn't safe for them to speak out, to be, to be angry. Most men that I work with, they cut their ability to be scared. And, and what, is, what I find important as a first step, it's like we have phases and uh, feelings competence is first phase is learn how to feel anger, sadness, fear, and joy. Learn how to, to like be with the feelings. And then second is how to access all of the information and the, and the energy because feelings are rocket fuel for your life. So what if anger and sadness and, and fear weren't bad? What if you can use anger for instead of for violence, you can use it for a more responsible outcome? You know, anger is a resource for you to say no for your boundaries. If you can't say no, your yes is a lie, basically. If you can't say no, then your yes doesn't mean anything. So you need anger to say no or to say yes. You need anger to make a decision. You need anger for resolve. You need anger for assertiveness. You need anger for um, changing your mind. You need anger for chopping wood, for, for catching your train when you're late. So you need, anger is what gives you power for action, for resolve. So anything in your life that needs resolve, decision, um, movement, it's your anger. Sadness gives you power. This is like this, this fuel for listening. Probably all of you have been in an argument with a lover. And just remember, go back into that and just notice if you remember like listening with anger and how that worked and listening with sadness and how that worked. You may even try it right now. Just switch between listening with a bit of anger, raise your anger and see how much you get in or how much resistance you feel. And then just put the anger down a little bit and raise your sadness. So sadness, sadness like slows down time, slows down the inner pace. You, you drop down because you slow down enough that you can perceive more of what's happening inside. It's kind of an energy that at first it's like inwards, sadness. But it's, it's also really amazing to, to connect with someone, to empathize, to, to move along in, with dancing. If anyone does partner dance, it requires a, kind of a listening to the body of the other person. Sadness is, gives us a, a, a particular power to, to, to communicate, to communicate heart to heart. But it's also super important for letting go, for grieving. So already anger and sadness, instead of being weak and unproductive and or, or destructive, 
there already can be tools and powers for something else. Fear is one that a lot of people have a huge um, difficulty because fear is seen as like, oh, most people have this meme that fear is death. Fear, I, I actually think there's only two fe fears that everything that people fear is like two fears. Fe one is fear of feeling fear. And the other one is fear of death. If I feel that, if I fear that no one's gonna, people are not gonna understand me and in this call, and then I'm gonna be rejected, and then I'm not gonna have any friends, and I'm, I'm gonna be alone. And you know, you know, being alone, being rejected and exiled from the community is a death, is a sort of death. So you can, you can check it out yourselves right now. Check out a fear that you have. It doesn't have to be a rational fear because it's a feeling. And feelings don't have to be rational. In fact, they're not rational. Check a feeling right now, like one, one fear that you have. It could be with your children, could be with your parents, could be with your health, could be with anything, the future. And then trace it. I'm afraid that this happens. And if this happens, what else might happen? And if you continue to trace where the fear goes, about 99% of the times it goes into death, about the fear of that. And that's super appropriate. It's appropriate to fear the things that we don't know how it's gonna be. None of us, I think, I don't remember dying. I don't know, I don't know how it is to die yet. So I'm scared. And, but fear is also a superpower because right now I have no idea what I, what's gonna happen next. But I can use this fear that I'm feeling right now to, to connect with you and to, and to hold space. And I can use this, this fear of not knowing what happens next, what, not knowing what happens after COVID, I, not knowing what's gonna happen and if, if we're all gonna survive climate change, I can use it to, to, do the, to, to live life while I'm alive. So if I don't know, if I really am not sure and I'm scared that I, that I might not live more than 10 years, it's really helping me to think, okay, so what do I want to do with these 10 years? If I don't know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow and I'm really, I really connect with that fear. Okay. So what do I want to do with my day right now? What is really important for me right now? So fear is an important, important and essential tool to create, to create the things that we need out of nothing because we don't know how it's gonna be. It's like a stepping into the unknown. Like I see a lot of people here, they're facilitators. You have facilitated either groups or uh, classrooms or projects. Who knew what was gonna happen at every single stage? Who knew that? No, no one? How did you do it? How, how, how did you even, Consider how to do the next step. I want to hear two people. How did you do it? It's going to be the person. Udi, can you tell me? I'm looking at you. How did you give the next step when you didn't know what was going to happen? In which situation? In a situation that you were holding space for a group. Uh, when I don't know what will happen, I, I was just a bit scared and just felt quiet and just said, uh, what, what am I, what is waiting to emerge here? And I just tried to listen what was there and, and took a risk in, in that. What was the risk that you took? Maybe in doing something that I hadn't done before or wasn't comfortable entirely in doing, but it felt right at that moment. Yeah. 
So that we, we create a path where there was no path before mm. by listening to that fear. Oh, thank you, Udi. I want to hear someone else. Yeah, I can go. Yeah, go to Pan. Um, uh, I, I think there are... I mean, most of the time, uh, Vera, it's like that only. I mean, I really don't know. I, I don't know what kind of uh, in-group coaching what's going to happen. Uh, I remember one coaching session I did when I was in uh, first session after, like when the COVID kind of just came, started online. And uh, we have never done any session on, on coaching session online. And... We did it uh, on Zoom. Zoom. Zoom didn't work, and we did it on phone. And uh, and yeah, I mean, then it's it was never like I I didn't know like what's going to happen next. Uh, whether they will able to be stay put at the same time, and uh, so there I think is a moment of surrender. Like I think I'm sure I am I'm fine personally. Whether online or offline, I am fine with whatever is happening. Uh, and I think that's the that's the space I genuinely like to hold. Am I am I am I getting across to you? Yeah, thank you. It's kind of what I hear from you is that you committed before knowing how it was going to happen. You just committed to the um, the other person. You committed to the process without knowing how exactly it was going to happen. And with that commitment and that fear, you were able to to forge a path. That, does that sound right, Darpan? Cool. Yeah, so fear is incredibly important um, because it also marks transitions, you know, transitions of that, those, those smaller depths in our lives, the thing that we don't know if we're gonna make it. We don't know if this step is really gonna work because sometimes it doesn't work the step that we make and we have to acknowledge that like the fear is very real that we might fail or do something that it ha doesn't have the consequences that we do that we want um and so fear just provides this this way of scanning this way of listening like uh, i give this example with um I've been in kind of like parties or social situations in houses where uh, once I just open a door, I open a door that I thought it was to the bathroom and it was a living room. And then suddenly I was, I was scared. Like I opened the door and what I expected wasn't there. And what I did in that moment, what, what I think usually people do is they scan, they scan what's going on, scan myself, and then um, address the situation. So when I opened the door and saw people in a room, they were talking and I, in like three seconds, I could, I could sense if I wanted to get into that room or if I just shut the door and I just interrupted something. You know, it's, it's easy if you, if you use your fear, your fear is basically, because your fear is basically scanning for danger everywhere scanning for, you know, movement on the corner of your eye, uh, presence. And so it's always scanning for, for a lot of information. And you can use that information to, to create new paths. I would, we'll go a little bit more, perhaps in our second practice, about if, if we go further into fear. I just wanted to kind of also bring joy. Because and isn't it sad that in modern culture, play and joy is almost seen as they don't count they're, they're not valuable enough you know there's work and then you know there's play but play is like is only for certain times you know joy is is fine but a little bit the real work in life life is more serious i know that some people in this and many people actually in this call don't live like this um particularly Manish, uh, who's not on the call anymore. But it's, joy is also seen as only appropriate in certain times. 
And actually, joy is one of the biggest motivations for people to, to join and do something to get together. So Dragon Dreaming is um, kind of a methodology um, project creation and management that um, a man called John Croft uh, developed with uh, Basin Aboriginal um, culture. And he basically uses, it's called the Dragon Dreaming, and it basically uses joy to really guide the path of what is it that I that I want to create in this world? What is it that I want to collaborate um, into, into manifestation? So it's, joy is, is a, an energy of manifestation and, and of invitation and of celebration. And it's very hardly used in, in work, it's hardly used in universities or, or in school. It's kind of like, okay, yay! You know that doesn't let things in you know or or a pre or deep appreciation when when i see most people having talks or or, or giving a performance um and and doing amazing work and then they're they're clapped people are happy they're like thank you and they clap them most people that i know they will like shy away and kind of will like oh thank you thank you it's nothing it's nothing Instead of letting that joy of being seen, of being appreciated by the village, come in. You know, some people say that, you know, there's a lot of wounds around not, not being loved that make us always look for love somewhere. And actually, there is a reverse part of that, which is the wound of, of not letting the love land not letting the love, like not knowing what it feels like to let really the love land on you. And, and to let that, that joy and that appreciation land in you. So with joy, with also all of our feelings, this is what we, we develop with possibility management. To really learn how to feel, to really allow our feeling body, our emotional body to to be seen, to, to run, to manifest, and then to co-create our, our path. Yes, um, I want to give another distinction and then I'd like to uh, uh, answer some questions and then do a, no, I want to do one more distinction and then want to do a practice and then ask questions. I think, I think to practice before more discussion is good. So uh, another distinction that, that I'd like to share is super, super revolutionary for me is the difference between feelings and emotions. So I'm calling feelings, anger, sadness, fear, and joy that are of the moment, that are like from right now. Like if, if my phone um, drops on my foot and it hurts and I feel angry, that's, that, that is from that pain, that is from right now. But if, for example, I, something happens and like, um, I get, something happens like someone interrupts me in a conversation and of, with a person that I care about and someone talks over me and I become angry. Um, and then I continue to be angry for a really long time, even after the conversation has passed, then that is not from right now. That's not from the event that was happening. So the difference between feelings and emotions is that feelings are from right now and emotions are not from right now. So if you feel, they feel exactly the same way, anger, emotional anger and feeling anger, sadness, fear or joy, they feel exactly in the same way in our bodies. But if the feeling lasts for more than three minutes, it is not from, the, from right now. So it's not a feeling, it's an emotion. And an emotion is awesome because it's not bad or good, it's a gateway. It's a gateway for a healing process. So for example, I was giving the example of, of when I'm interrupted in the middle of a conversation, I, it's, a, it's a gateway for me 
to go through a healing process because I actually was interrupted a lot when I was a kid. And, um, and so when I, with my ex-partner, he would interrupt me and I would just burst in, in, instead of just the, Hey, st stop interrupting me. I would, I would first freeze and then explode. And it wasn't anything to do with my ex-partner. It was because I had experienced that so many times and I never expressed it that the emotional experience, I hadn't processed it. So feelings are to deal with things and emotions are to heal things. So this is, this is an amazing um, distinction because you can be feeling something right now and if you continue to feel the same thing, then you can, then you can say, you can actually ask for some space holding for some, from, from someone to, and we have, um, we have um, places and spaces exactly for emotional healing that, that you go through the root of what is going on so that you can heal and, and then the energy gets released for your life. You can actually have a new life. So feelings are for healing, uh, feelings are for dealing with things and emotions are for healing things. And I want to, I want to put you in groups of four. And um, let me see how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Yes, I'm going to put you in groups of four. And um, I'd like you to go in turns. And just say and choose, choose um, um, a theme. Choose something could be about this call, could be about an object, could be about your dad, could be about yourself, could be about what, like choose one person or one object. And then you're going to say, I feel angry because whatever comes out. I feel sad because whatever comes out. I feel uh, scared because, or, and I feel joy because, and about the same thing. So this is just, this is an exercise to just getting us to acknowledge what feeling feels like and uh, articulate it. So really, instead of how this works is that you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going to come out. You connect first with your heart, with your feeling. And then you speak without, without um, curtailing it, without making it pretty, without even making it reasonable, okay? So this is just a small practice. You choose the same thing and you go, I feel um, glad, sad, mad, or scared, okay? There, is there any questions about this? We're do gonna we, do this for a couple of minutes. Do one of us choose the same object or everyone chooses a different object? Everyone chooses a different object. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be a thing. It could be a tree or a place, or, you know, it could be your favorite place um, to sit by, for example. It could yeah, be personal gonna... also. Yes, it could be personal. So you, but you keep the same one. And again, try not to stay in your head. Just really go into the feeling and just speak from there. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to the, again, to the main room. And I just want you to, let's take a, a, a deep breath together to kind of acknowledge the changing of spaces. Yeah. So because um, originally, um, because we had a lot of technical issues. Um, I am, I know that the, the technically the, the call is meant to finish in about three minutes and we started about 25 minutes late. So I am available for staying until um, a bit longer. And if someone can't or um, for any reason, that's, that's all right. <laughs> okay, like you can always go whenever you want, just say something in the chat so so i know that um you're all right 
I want to hear from you. How was your experience? And if you have a question. Thank you, Andrea. I'm going, so please, if you want to speak, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Otherwise, I don't know. Yeah, no, you can go. Just unmute yourself and, and share how it was for you. So uh, I think for me, it was something new, like choosing a, any object and associating uh, sadness, anger, joy, fear with it. And so I felt a, a sense of exploration, like, you know, the curiosity, the sense of like joy in doing, even when you're talking about fear, because a sense of newness, a novelty of doing something just, you know, so yeah, just simple little bit of freshness is what I felt. Thank you. Anyone else? Go, go on, Shuma. Thank you. So uh, we had only three people in the group. Uh, very interestingly, uh, we all talked about our fathers. One person talked about a father-like figure and two talked about our fathers. So uh, very simple observation that I'm sharing is that uh, we often uh, try to blame a particular person or object for negative uh, emotions, but it is actually we who are drawing different emotions from the same person or same object. So it is more how we are relating rather than the object or person. So that is... Mm -hmm. And how it was for you to do this practice? How did it go? Uh, I think it was very little time uh, to dive deep because all the people wanted to share and talk a lot more. It was very little time. Yeah. Was, was good, yeah, yeah I, I do start really short and small because we have tendencies to make more and more stories. Yeah. And, and a lot of the times it takes us to our head again. And so the the way that i build up the practice is to first really start small and, and just acknowledge i feel this and then i feel that and then i feel this so it's great and also i want to, to just i think i said it but i may have not uh said it very clearly the consideration that i'm um the proposition that i have for this call uh, and you to can try with is that there's no negative emotions or positive emotions the there's just emotions and so they the emotions can have uh, they're just like energy and it's it's kind of like saying north is bad or north is negative in fact they're orientations in in possible with the work that i do this is how uh i want to bring and i just wanted to say it to basically everyone because yeah, it's, it's an orientation more than like good or bad. Yeah, Anshuman? Can I ask a small question? Yes. Yeah, because uh, uh, at this stage, at least I could not understand your last point, uh, mm -hmm. simply because I think uh, if, I, if I try to observe certain emotions, they tend to uh, disturb or agitate or irritate. So I term them usually as a negative emotion uh, but other other emotions will not agitate me they will keep me more calm and joyful so uh, maybe i'll try to think more about this but right now i'm not able to uh, i mean i by default i'm counting some as negative and others as positive yeah thank you thank you yeah that was what i said in the beginning of the the, the call that um most of modern culture proposes that feelings there are bad feelings or good feelings, negative feelings or positive feelings. And my proposition is that there, that's, that evaluation um, has consequences, which is um, usually to repress and to oppress uh, our whole parts of our um, feeling um, experience and that actually feelings aren't good or bad or negative and positive, they're just energies and then we can use them responsibly or irresponsibly. So this is like the premise that I'd like to, to make the continue exploring and you don't have to believe in it. It's just kind of, let's experiment with this, with this meme. 
cake. I want to hear how it was for other people. Yes, Arcana. Archana or Arcana? Archana. Archana, thank you. Okay, so um, I think emotions and feelings uh, with a person in mind uh, are intense and they are very, very different. And there might be few expressions which I but when it comes down to object, there is uh, the sensation uh, that As in, it is, it is of joy and uh, you know, a lot of other things. But I don't know if anger really plays a very, very important. So I, what I noticed with me was that uh, in our group, every one of us spoke about objects. You know, like like Anshuman's group, everybody spoke about fathers, and it did come to my mind. And then I'm like, you know what? I would like to go with an object and because if I start dwelling on something else, it might just, there is no end to it. So when we looked at the object, uh, there was joy, there was sadness, there was fear, uh, but anger was not there. Like, you know, it, was, it wasn't the most uh, prominent uh, emotion in, in that. But I, I very quickly switched and I said, what if I was talking about a person? And probably anger would have been in, in that point. There would have been a sadness too. But anger would have been the most prominent one in the kind of time. Thank but you. It's very interesting to share when you look at what you're looking at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Archana. Thank you for doing that experience with object and person. Uh, I, Gitika has uh, said that she wanted to speak, or he, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually yeah. don't know you. Yeah. Gitika, yeah. Gitika. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that the time was less and I, like my turn couldn't come, uh, but I was like, I was just like quickly making a note of all those four lines because I knew I wouldn't be able to speak, but I really wanted to do the exercise. So what happened to me was that I was already like, you know, very similar, like you spoke about interruption. So just before the call, there was something that happened and like the buzz remained for me throughout the call. And uh, so I was just kind of feeling a little angry and a bit irritated. And I just noticed that I could not really uh, feel um, joy or associate, like, you know, kind of do the exercise also, because just the joy is not there. So it's just not there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I kind of felt a bit blocked. And that uh, leads me to my question that, uh, I mean, of course, this experience is much longer. Like, uh, like you shared the difference or distinction between emotion and feeling. So this is an emotion, I guess, which is coming up because it's very strongly there. Uh, so I don't know, like what I struggle with is how to kind of, you know, get a grip on things sometimes because, you know, like uh, I think I'm someone who really allows myself to feel stuff, but then I also find myself a lot of times uh, you know, like in a pool, like where I don't know how to swim out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, also like, I don't know much about your work. So maybe if you can also use this opportunity to really tell me that how, how does this really work? Like, um, in terms of, um, yeah, I don't know, just putting it simply getting a grip on things. Yeah. Can I ask you just a, a clarifying question? Sure. What do you mean with getting a grip on things? Uh, like I said, you know, like when you allow yourself to feel things, then they're just like you know, all over you. And mm. uh, how sometimes it's really, really hard to kind of find your way out of there, you know, because when, like, there have been times when I wasn't aware of, uh, you know, like you said, it's a gateway. I totally agree. It's a gateway. Mm. But, you know, it's like, I had no clue where it's leading me. And then I was somewhere where I was like, oh, fuck, I didn't know this even existed. Yeah. And then it's really oh. hard to kind of come out. You know? uh, it's another world altogether, in a way. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to take a few more questions and then uh, and, and, and uh, sharing of this experience that you just have. And then I will speak to it. Also, there is Ipek say asked, I would like to know more what you mean by using the energy responsibly and irresponsibly. Well, I'm just going to write it down. No one wants to share. Um, 
how it was for them? Okay. Um, I can go next. Oh, thank uh, you. So, yeah. So when I was trying to connect to my feeling and emotion, I felt that I was feeling a range of things and it was difficult to pin it to a name, a word. And it was easier for me to relate to the bodily sensation that I was feeling uh, in my heart. So I was just wondering what's the role of using a word uh, when we are trying to process our emotion. Mm -hmm. So I ended up telling why I was feeling and what I was feeling in my body rather than pinning it to my a, a word in the sharing session we did. Um, can you give me an example? So I felt that I was slightly triggered and I was feeling a bit uh, scared or, or a little bit of fear, a little bit of sadness uh, in the moment. And as I was sharing it, I wasn't sure. Like it, my, my emotion really did not fit into either of it. So for me, I bypassed the words and just uh, shared that how I'm feeling in my heart. My heart is racing for whatever uh, reasons and other things that I was feeling in my body. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And your question was, um, what's the relevance of using the four words of the feelings, right? Yeah. One last comment and question before I kind of try to, to answer these. That one has a uh, raised hand. Oh, there. yes. Unmute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my actually my, my question was uh, about you know these uh, the if you look at the the first three of uh, the fear, anger, and sadness. Uh, so one once uh, once you feel it, there is also a space in which until unless I'm aware and I'm I mean one of the thing is the practices are in mindfulness is to watch them, uh, and so when I'm feeling. Uh, then uh, there is a field, I mean, a lack of any other word I'm saying, field, uh, where I am also realizing that I may take my sadness to them, right? So when I feel sad, maybe where I is feeling sad because I am feeling sad. If I am feeling angry, then uh, my anger will have repercussions or some sort of ramification on you. Um, and similarly, uh, for uh, for the, you know, the, the fear. So joy is the only thing where the other person will have, uh, I mean, uh, where, the, where the other person will be like, okay, that's nice, you know. Uh, therefore, uh, the, 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 the part of the other person's involvement in, in this, uh, and not just to learn, how does that play out in the narrative of fear, anger, sadness, and joy? How, I'm sorry, I don't know if I, I could hear all of it, but how does what play out? Uh, I mean, when there is another person involved, so for example, in the, in the triad, uh, I was like, also was reflecting that if I'm talking about my fear, anger, and sadness, mm -hmm. uh, I hope my fear, anger, and sadness is not, they are not feeling that, right? Kind of mm -hmm. feeling the responsibility of the other. So how does it, how does it play out when there are others in there? I hope it was it was clear now, Vera. Yes, thank you. Yeah, how does it play out? Like feeling also with other people, I suppose, right? So feeling all of these when other people are sharing and what you experience yourself. Is that correct, Zerpan? Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's consider this, like there's an old map of feelings and the old map of feelings is there is some emotions or feelings that are negative and some that are positive and that, uh, you know, it's not okay to feel the negative uh, feelings or it's, it's kind of bad. It means there's something wrong. This old map of feelings and emotions is what usually modern culture um this kind of the colonial empire um empire culture does because we have um what we've been discovering in possibility management is that there we have a feeling body we have an emotional body that just has sensations and that 
and um, what that I'm calling feelings. And this is like our heart. And this is always happening. This, this feeling capacity is always happening. And it's because of the memes of modern culture that says they're good or bad, right or wrong, negative and positive. Then it excuses, it like changes our view and our relationship through our feeling body. So there's this old map of feelings where feelings are not really okay because they're not productive. They're, you know, um, the, the, you know, you can use, like I said, in the, um, in the beginning, you can use anger irresponsibly and, and act on violence and hurt someone. But you can also, if you switch from that old map of feelings where feeling is not okay and there's good feelings and bad feelings to the new map of feelings, which is what I'm uh, proposing, is that feelings aren't good or bad. Emotions aren't good or bad. They're not positive nor negative. It's a proposal. They're not positive nor negative. They are just energies full of information about you and your surroundings that you can use uh, consciously and responsibly to your life. So with anger, in the old map of feelings, if you see anger as a bad thing, as a negative emotion, then it's something that you don't want to have because it's bad. So I'm going to do all the things that I can to make it stop. I want it to make it stop. I want to get to grips with, uh, that's not what um, Gietika was meaning, but it's um, most people want to get out of it. I'm feeling angry and I want it to stop because it's bad and makes me feel weird and I don't want it. So this is in the old map of feelings. What I'm proposing in the new map of feelings is basically that feeling angry is just feeling angry. There's energy there. There's movement wanting to happen. And if we learn how to feel and stay present without evaluating the feeling as bad or good or negative or positive, we are going to be able to have more choice over it. What am I going to do with this energy? I'm going to chop wood. I'm going to clean my house. I'm going to do that decision. I'm going to run that mile. I'm going to start this project because these guys are not doing it. You have choice if you feel it. If you, if you turn to the new map of feelings, you suddenly, if you say, if you suddenly can feel anger and, and don't want to get out of it. Like when I feel anger or sadness or joy or fear, I don't want to get out of it. I don't want it to stop. I just want to like, okay, I listen to my fear or I listen to my anger and I ask it like, okay, so what do you have for me? Okay. I feel angry right now because, um, this person, I just saw this person, um, ignoring the, her, her child. Okay. I feel angry right now. Okay. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do with this anger? Okay. I am going to make sure that I don't do that. I'm going to keep myself in check. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, create a way to support parents to be able to relate with their children in a way that it's like to uh, enhance the competence, emotional competence, so they can be not so dismissive to their kids. So that's my decision and that's my commitment. That's what I'm doing with the energy of anger. Also what I'm doing with the energy of anger right now is that I'm raising my voice and I'm trying, you know, getting the energy up from this meeting. So this is kind of how, how these things really work. I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily, if I don't think that feeling is negative in any way, feeling, if someone, if someone dies close to me, dies, I don't want to not feel sad. I mean, it doesn't mean that I want to feel sad all the time. There's also other things that I want to do. But I think if I feel sad and if I, if I do, if it comes naturally and I don't stop it, then I'm, I go through this beautiful process of remembering my friend and um, cherishing my friend and connecting with the love and appreciation and the loss. And I actually, the, the sadness connects me more with the love. Now, it's not 
it's not the energy, the most efficient energy to say, start, um, start a new project with this huge grief. No, that's not what sadness energy is for. Sadness energy is to slow down. It's to, it's to grieve, it's to let go, it's to connect. And if I do feel sad, I don't want to get out of it because it is informing me about something important about myself, my body, or um, my surroundings. Like in this case, the death of a friend. And you'd like to really let that uh, clean. So sometimes this emotions, we can let it come when it's not a feeling from the from the now, it's like an emotion from the past or from, from our parents or, you know, cause emotions could be ours, but it could also not be ours. There's, I know people who have feelings that come from their previous generations, from their ancestors. I know families that are in war with each other for generations and their their offspring their kids learn to to adopt these new these feelings of animosity about this other family but the feeling isn't theirs the feeling is from some ancestor who had this um big gripe about something so if if you have an emotion this is to kind of relate to that question Okay, how does this really work? And we go into and go into the emotion, and then what? What happens? Like, what if it never goes away? If it's an emotion, emotions don't usually go away until they're healed. They kind of come knock on our doors, and if we don't have the, if we don't give the time to process them, they kind of eventually go back into the background, but then they come back and knock on our doors again. So what, with this emotional competence and literacy, what we've developed in possibility management are really effective healing spaces where um, when I do that in my possibility coaching, I'm fully committed to that person. I don't know what's going to happen or how, you know, I don't have an agenda of like, this is what happens in this step, this step, but I'm just with that person the whole way until we find what their emotion is telling them. It's like the key to your own healing lies in your own bodies. And when I am holding space for an emotional healing process with another person, I almost don't have to do anything. I just have to be really present and attentive. And your bodies will tell me, will tell me exactly what needs to happen. So it's in a way, you know, like, Traditional shamanism, it's the shaman who goes and cleans and takes something out or banishes something from the person being healed. With possibility management, this kind of like shamanism or what this possibility management, you are the ones doing it to yourselves. I am just there holding space, witnessing, and keeping a safe, clear space. And you are the ones to go through that through your own emotions. Um, and how it works is, is basically it's feeling. You, you feel it to heal it. And, and it, it's not about, it's not about like the Osho techniques of catharsis because I found I used to do that and my, my, my parents used to do that, um, the catharsis. And I think it's useful um, also like revaluation counseling. They're, they're good for discharge of the energy. But the thing is that until it's healed, that energy will come back. So if either you do like what Osho communities, you do a discharge every morning and then, you know, the next morning and I have to do it again, or which is what we do in possibility management, we don't do catharsis. We do cathexis, which is also cathexis. It's also um, a Greek word. And instead of meaning to... Um, expel um it means to hold so it, there is expression and you hold that energy because it's exactly the energy of that emotion and that intensity that is required is the key to heal 
what needs to be healed. So I know I'm kind of um, bringing, trying to describe what a healing process is, but it's also like, how do you describe what a sweat lodge is to someone who, you know, you don't explain it, you go through it <laughs> in a way. You know, how do you, how do you explain a healing of a broken heart to a person? You don't, you go through it. So what other questions was it? <clears throat> so using energy responsibly and irresponsibly. Anger, sadness, fear, and joy are resources. Are your own, so another way that I like looking at things is that we have um, at least four bodies. I know the minute tradition says we have many bodies, I like to distinguish four main bodies, the mental, the physical, the emotional and energetic. And just because they have different foods and they have different types of pain and different types of ecstasy, but they always interact with each other. But the emotional body, like any other part of ourselves, we can use it responsibly or irresponsibly. Um, like with a knife, I can use it to cut um, onions or I can use it to cut through flesh of a person. You know, I can use um, a shovel to, to dig a grave. I can use a shovel to dig a garden. I can use, you know, it's how, I'm not saying that digging graves is irresponsible, by the way. I'm just saying that there's various uses for for um, the resources that we have. And um, cathexis is with a K, but it's fine. I think if you uh, Google it, it'll come out. So using the energy of an emotion respond of the feeling responsibly is to know the purpose, to, to what are you using it for? Are you using this energy to manipulate something, someone? Are you using it to compete with someone? Or are you using it to create more possibilities of collaboration? Are you, am I using, you know, I can use anger to raise my voice and shut someone up because I think I'm better than them. Or I can use my anger to raise my voice to shut someone up that is, um, saying really dangerous, abusive things. So the thing about responsibility is that it's, it's about its consciousness in action. And it's about the context and the people who are there and, and it's individual. I think I had one last question, which was how does it play out when we feel each other? So we are sentient beings that are in constant communication, nonverbal communication with each other. So if someone is feeling, if someone is feeling sad in a room and I am sensitive to what I am feeling, I'm not distracted, I'm not numb, I just, I didn't have just like a couple of beers or something, um, I will feel it, you will feel it. Like, it's very easy to spot a person who's really nervous in a room, even if they don't say anything. That's because we have resonance. So if someone feels anger, sad, fear, or joy, your body will feel a little bit too. We'll, we'll recognize it. We'll just recognize it. And I was sure that, you know, like when Darpan was saying, you know, I could feel um, when they were feeling this, but then you, Sometimes we don't feel when the other person's feeling that. I wonder if the reason why we're not feeling a certain feeling is because we think it's a bad feeling or a negative feeling. And so we are so used to numbing it because it's uncomfortable. So my experiments and my field of research are exactly to feel, to radically feel and to give, have more options from there. If I don't see anger, sadness, or joy as good, 
or positive or negative, then I have so much more things about it. Like I can, I can do so many more experiments about it. And my experiments um, have had amazing results. Um, I want to say that I just want to put, I want to put like a couple of um, e um, website resources in the chat that has a little bit more information about four feelings and the uh, distinction of feelings versus emotions and the bodies, the four bodies, so that you can see. So do you have any comments or questions? I know we're kind of coming to a close. So is there any quick comments or questions? Please shoot. And just unmute yourself and you can speak. Hi, Vera. This is Shristi. Hi, Shristi. Uh, thanks. I think a lot of things were really powerful for me, even the connect uh, the session breakout rooms that we had. Uh, one question I had was, uh, how do you get more in touch with your feelings? So a lot of times I know I'm, there's something wrong or I don't know wrong, but there's something going on, but I'm not able to like point out. I mean, my friends ask me, okay, what are you feeling or why are you feeling sad? And then I'm not really able to like tap into that emotion and figure out okay what is happening there so is there anything that you know you could do maybe practice or something to get more in touch with your feelings yeah thank you um so one of the first things to start really is to um to extricate a bit of, of like just having the pure four feelings because when we when we start mixing feelings ones with others we get this emotional mix and we lack the clarity of of the feeling itself so for example if i mix um joy and sadness and mix them together and feel them as meshed then i experience something kind of like nostalgia or you know even if it has if it has more more sadness than 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 joy it's not even nostalgia it's kind of like melancholy you know, like melancholy is a bit sadder, but it's not totally sad. Uh, the problem is when we mesh these emotions together, they're like scrambled up and we don't get the clarity of what we're sad about and we don't get the clarity of what we're um, happy about. So one of the, I'm going to share the mixed emotions, also distinction with you um, in the chat so that you can read and really experience when you start seeing when you start just using the four uh, feelings practice, uh, and I'm going to describe how it could work. Um, you already start seeing the clarity. You will start already um, creating a relationship to, to the, to the experiential feeling of that sadness, the experiential feeling of the anger and the joy and the fear in that your body will start telling you. So what I have, is basically like four objects. I have four stones and I have one is always anger, one is sadness, fear and joy, and you can have different objects. And you can go each morning and, and grab the anger one and just say, okay, anger, what am I angry about? And just say out loud everything that you're angry in that moment for, you can put a timer for like two minutes. I'm angry that I forgot to pee. I'm angry that my foot is hurting. I'm angry because I'm too hot. I haven't opened the window. I'm, I'm angry because that person hasn't called me back. I'm angry because I have an itch, but I can't reach it. I'm, I'm angry because feelings have a, have a variety of intensities from like zero to 100%. So irritation, annoyance, frustration, anger, and rage is all anger, it's all different intensities of anger. So instead of saying to yourself as a practice, I'm irritated, I'm peeved, I'm just use angry, because then you start to feel the, what is the actual experience, the energetic experience of, of that feeling. So you do the same thing with the, with, the four, with the four feelings, each morning or each evening before you go to bed, just for like, you know, one minute or two minutes each, just as a practice. Th does that work, yeah. Shristi? Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. That
more questions before I'm going to one more question or two more questions really fits up and then I think I'm going to close it. And go and unmute yourself. Maybe I'll ask if nobody is asking. Yep, go for it. Uh, thank you, Vera. Uh, so one question, I think uh, I, I that was uh, I was just reflecting on that uh, that the question of cap uh, capability. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Is that for example, you know, uh, so we have a bunch of people. Uh, we are trying to do some prototyping work for uh, uh, refugee. Uh, and we had a call with someone who has been doing a lot of work uh, with the refugee camps and migrants and asylum seekers, uh, facilitating sharing circles and some, you know. So one thing which really struck me was uh, she mentioned that, uh, you know, she actually got into one-on-one -on -one conversations. And uh, and I, to cut a long story short, I'm just trying to win zip it, is that traumas are so deep, these people have, that uh, she didn't realize that where is, you know, she's good with the holding circle, but not with one on one. And so the trauma has become so much that uh, she actually realizing it that uh, she had no secondary trauma. So she mentioned that, that uh, she kind of realized that the psychologists were the right person to kind of navigate that space. Uh, so the question I'm asking you is this what, uh, uh, that where is that line when we are going to experiment? Uh, uh, what is it you're proposing that uh, is there a line where one says okay I think this is where one needs to know that okay this is my capability and if I cross that maybe I'm not sure if I am capable of getting into that, that space so uh, yeah I didn't do any experiment but it, I'm just still holding the question and seeing how it uh, goes from there thank you thank you Darpa. I just want to add to this question mm -hmm. actually uh, yeah, okay, like a so. sub question, which is very, which is very much linked to what I asked earlier. Is how do you, uh, like contain them? You know, how do you contain your feelings as well? How do you build that resilience or that capacity, uh, to feel them and yet be okay with it? You know. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, like how you learned anything else. You know, it, you 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 practice it and you practice it not alone um which is yeah so there's for example i'm not holding at the moment but sometimes i hold uh rage clubs exactly to guide people to connect with their anger and um i choose to go with anger first because it's one that really allows for protection and boundaries so that we can go into the other feelings afterwards but when a person has a stable kind of grounding of safety of how to make themselves safe and ask for that what they want and ask to stop which is a very important thing for people to have to to keep themselves safe that not everyone does so yeah it it would be to practice and to to learn to go to trainings and um to learn to trainings to to develop your capacity of of, of holding your feelings to be with your feelings without being a hostage of them and i i used to have i used to you know i always i i always felt a lot since i was uh, very young had a lot of intense feelings and emotion and and i, I never really had a, a big issue with feeling them but i would get annoyed because that they wouldn't you know it didn't feel like anything changed i'm just like oh again really emotional about something and the working with the distinctions of what are feelings useful for, what each of the feelings are useful for, and really listening to what each feeling is trying to tell me, what emotion is trying to tell me, has been really, um, and it's something that I've learned in trainings, it's something that really has helped me to figure out where I am on a map. Is it, is it an emotion? Okay, if it's an emotion, then it has nothing to do with this person in front of me. So then I can really, um, I can go to a mentor or I can go to a possibility coach and I can give uh, also here a huge list of 
things, um, some for free, some that are for contributions that are being offered right now online in this COVID time for people who are wanting to be with their feelings. Um, and so, yeah, to listen, to listen, to, to develop like, like any development of any new competence and capacity, and there needs to be practice. There needs to be new distinctions, new ways of seeing things and then experimenting with them. And, um, does that more or less answer your question, Gatika? Yeah, yeah, it does. Mm. Okay. I mm -hmm. mean, of course, after the, I mean, of course, it does answer, but beyond this, it's a long journey, right? I mean, yeah, and it's yeah. almost like a life of, of practice. Um, yeah. If if your uh, objective isn't to get rid of feeling, but it's to use it like befriend your feeling and use its fuel as a rocket fuel for, for, for loving better, for creating more fun and joyful projects, for uh, your ability to, to create something has never been created before. You know, it, it really can catapult your life into a completely um, more, I would say, enlivening <laughs> uh, direction because you are really aligned with more resources that you have. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That was very useful um, and very powerful. Actually, very empowering. Whatever you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Darpan, I'm not sure if I answered your question. And I'm just going to say that the the last this link that I'm just sharing, possibility virus virus, is a, a, the list of practitioners that are at the moment offering online possibility teams that we're. Um, they support people and the possibility teams are usually free that if you want to, to try it out, you don't have to have any experience in possibility management. It's um, you can, you can, if you are feeling something, if you are wanting to uh, have some possibilities and some ideas and some practices, you can always go there. So if you want to start practicing a little bit and at the moment we don't have, for example, any circle of trainers in India, uh, but I love that if there's people who resonate, I think it'd be amazing <laughs> to have. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Vera. Thank you. Well, we're, it's um, 11 minutes past six on my side, and I, I really want to start closing. And so I want to appreciate everyone who stayed, stayed until the end in this kind of nonlinear kind of informal, formal space. I hope I, I gave you some new proposals to try out for your life. And I really, really um, hope that you check out some of the websites. They are full of pearls and ideas for experiments that you can do by yourself or you can do with someone online or someone next to you. And if you do any of them, please, please, please tell me. I would love to know how it's going and if you need any support or you know, have any doubts on how to do this with someone, please ask me. Um, yeah, my contacts are on the, my website, which I also shared in the, in the chat. So I would like just everyone to say goodbye in their native tongue all at the same time before we go. And yeah, I appreciate you all for um, giving me the best, best gift, which is your presence. Thank you. So let's all say it. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put everyone unmuted, which is a power that I have. <laughs> okay, everyone can, can now say it at the same time. One, two, three. <laughs> Tchau. Obrigada. Obrigado, Vera. Obrigada. Tchau. 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 Tch